ஓரஞ்சனம் நித்தியம் அனந்தரூபம் பக்தானுகம்பாதிரிதவிகிரகம் வை ஈஷாவதாரம் பரமேஷமிடியம் தங்கராமகிருஷ்ணம் சிரசாநமாம ஜனனிம் சாரதாம் தேவிம் ராமகிருஷ்ணம் ஜகத்குரும் பாதபத்மேத்தோஸ்ருவா பிரணமாமி முகூருமுகு நமஸ்ரீயதிராஜாய விவேகானந்தசூரை சச்சிதுசுகஸ்வரூபாய சுவாமினே தாபாரிணே So today we are going to enter the 6th chapter of Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga. The chapter is titled as Non-Attachment is Complete Self-Abnegation. So let us just start reading the text and then we will go to the discussions wherever necessary. Just as every action <clears throat> that emanates from us comes back to us as reaction even so our actions may act on other people and theirs on us perhaps all of you have observed it as a fact that when persons do evil actions they become more and more evil they become more and more evil and when they begin to do good they become stronger and stronger and learn to do good at all times this intensification of the influence of action cannot be explained on any other ground than that we can act and react upon each other so this is the idea which swami vivekananda is bringing in in this lecture at the very beginning that our mind is not a segregate mind just the way in the social network in the facebook we find that we are networked in such a way the moment you uh search something in the youtube or in the facebook or certain posts you favor you will find that's the thing which is always uh being posted in sequence the sequence is such your preference comes first so the cosmic mind is something like this social uh, media networking the facebook algorithm uh, decides that which post that the people will be seeing which post will be seeing every time they check their facebook when they check we see a particular post and you will find the order of this post show up as per our interest the so same thing happens as if in this cosmic mind whatever you are prone to whatever you think whatever the way you act immediately as if you get attuned to a particular vibration of your mental thoughts and all the thoughts which corresponds to that vibration you as if attract so we are as if transmitting as well as receiving we are transmitting our thoughts and all the thoughts which are of the same frequency we start our mind becomes a receptor of all those thoughts so that way our mind is not a segregate mind constantly we are influencing each other so that's the thing swami ji is indicating at the very beginning of his lecture so this intensification of the influence of action cannot be explained on any ground than that we can act and react upon each other to take an illustration from the physical science when i am doing a certain action 
my mind may be said to be in a certain state of vibration. All minds which are in similar circumstances will have the tendency to be affected by my mind. If there are different musical instruments tuned alike in one room, all of you may have noticed that when one is struck, the others have the tendency to vibrate so as to give the same note. So all minds that have the same tension, so to say, will be equally affected by the same thought. Of course, this influence of thought on mind will vary according to the distance and other causes, but the mind is always open to affection. It's like, just like owning a particular channel in your TV or tuning your radio to a particular frequency and immediately you find that whatever is being transmitted on that channel or on that radio frequency is immediately visible and audible to you. So we find it is there in the physical science now, even from the time of Swamiji, it is now much more prominent that all we search for is already being transmitted. It's already there in the atmosphere. But the moment we tune to it, we immediately receive it. So that's what Swamiji is indicating is our mind. The mind is also working in the same way. The mind is something which is non-local. Many of us will say that, that we cannot understand the process of transmigration. When a biological child has been born, is still in the mother's womb, how can a soul enter into it? It's impractical. But we always think in the terms of something physical entering into the physical body of the child. It's not like that. It's more like a transmission. The death is like the death of a TV. Suppose you are watching the TV and the TV goes out of order and in no way you can mend it. So what you have to do, you have to just simply throw it off and buy a new TV. And when you buy a new TV, it has a new total, this new makeup. It's all the total makeup is new. But the moment you own the channel which you were watching, immediately the same transmission you can see. So there nothing has entered as such physically into the TV. The transmission is already there. It's non-local. Similarly, when we leave off one body, it's like just discarding one TV. Physically, we are born with another parent. It is just a new body is born. But that body, when we are searching for the mind, if I think that the mind is something which has to be implanted within, it's not something like that. The mind is not the brain. Brain is part of the body through which the mind works. The mind is working through the brain. It is the brain is not the mind. The mind is something non-local. And that non-local mind is something like a transmission, which is constantly in interaction with each other. We can understand the concept of mind if we take another example. Just take the soil. Soil is the breeding ground for all types of plants. When I plant the seeds, the seeds are like our individuality. Each and every one of us is as if like a seed. Our mind is like a seed our personal individual mind. Now from the seed of suppose an apple tree, the apple sprouts out. From the seed of a mango, from the seed of a mango plant, from the stone of the mango plant, a mango plant sprouts out. And we say it is from the seed that the plant is sprouting. But actually what is happening? It's not the seed. The breeding ground has all the nutrients, has all the minerals, the water, the minerals, everything is being, is being, is being as if collected from the ground. The seed is not, by itself not producing the plant. It is just the gateway. It is just a gateway through which all the nutrients are entering and it is getting assimilated in a particular way to create that plant. 
It's the breeding ground, the same breeding ground, which, from which the mango tree is coming because particular nutrients are being absorbed by the roots of that plant, which is from the seed that roots which comes out by that it is absorbed and it is assimilated in a particular way to come out as a tree. The, for the apple, the same thing is happening, but the way they are assimilating is different. But it's the same, the, as far the ingredient is concerned, the same breeding ground, from there the ingredients are being taken and molded in a particular fashion by the particular mind. So as such, all the plants in common has the same breeding ground. What they're doing with that, with the ingredients, that constitutes their individual personality. So all the, our, our minds that way have the same breeding ground, just like the internet. All sorts of informations are available. My world is created, what I download, what I search for. So if I'm a medical student, the things which I will be searching for will be totally different from the one who is a, a student of technology or an engineering student. His search will be something different. So we are creating our world by what we are searching. The internet as such has all the informations. So it is not a segregated mind. All the minds are interconnected, just the way that we, the internet, and through the internet, we all are interconnected. So this all the minds, uh, to take an illustration from the physical science, when I am doing a certain action, my mind may be said to be in a certain state of vibration. All minds which are in a similar circumstances will have the tendency to be affected by my mind. If there are different musical instruments tuned alike in one room, all of you may have noticed that when one is struck, the others have the tendency to vibrate so as to give the same note. So all minds that have the same tension, so to say, will be equally affected by the same thought. Of course, this influence of thought on mind will vary according to the distance and other causes, but the mind is always open to affection. So that's what we were discussing. Suppose I'm doing an evil act. My mind is in a certain state of vibration and all minds in the universe, which are in a similar state, have the possibility of being affected by the vibration of my mind. So when I am doing a good action, my mind is in another state of vibration and all minds similarly strung have the possibility of being affected by my mind. And this power of mind upon mind is more or less according to the force of tension, which is greater or less. So it depends on the by force of tension, Swami is indicating the particular frequency, the particular state of vibration in which my mind is all other minds which are in that state are going affected, is getting affected by that. And in turn, the other's mind, which resembles to the state of vibration of my mind, they also are received in by my mind. So both the way it is happening. It's a networking, the, all the minds are that way, networked. And wherever the frequency matches, we find that there is the transmission of thoughts. Uh, from outside and also from, from, uh, from, the, the, from the person to the entire world. So that's what constantly is going on. So following this simile further, it is quite possible that just as light waves may travel for millions of years before they reach an object, so thought waves may also travel hundreds of years before they meet an object with which they vibrate in unison. So Swamiji was very, very uh, well versed in the science, in the contemporary science. So at night when we look at the sky, we are actually looking through the time machine. The sky which we feel is as if the present, it is not the present, it is the past. Some star which you are seeing, the stars which you are seeing, you think that the light which has been emanated by the star, I am saying no. Most probably there's the idea of light years is there. That 
that you know that the light travels at this tremendous speed we know nothing which travels faster than light and that speed when it that light is traveling the distance it will cover in one year after traveling that speed so you can just imagine what a big distance so those stars are like that in maybe hundreds of such million that's light years away this is called light year the distance traveled by light in one year is one light year so it is something a huge uh, distance and there will be several such light years away that star is so means the light which i am seeing coming from the star the star which i am seeing in the sky is actually far far away from where the light has actually has taken several millions of years to reach the earth so when i'm looking at the sky actually i'm looking at the star where what the, the, it was millions of years back even some stars might have died it's not there at all but in the sky i still see it because the light which was transmitted millions of years back i am seeing it now it took that much of time so what i am seeing when i look at the sky at night it is not the present it is the past it has took taken so much time maybe millions of years for the light to traverse through that that space from the star to the earth so when you are looking at the night sky it is as if you are looking through a time machine to the past so swami vivekananda was aware of these modern observations of the science in those days so what he is saying that our thought waves are also something like this light it's never lost just the way the light which was emanated millions of years back by a star is reaching me now similarly a thought which was thought of by a person by a suppose a realized soul it is always said that the prophets are born ahead of time you will find that prophets are always the prophets are always misjudged jesus was crucified no one understood him it was it is a much later when the centuries pass by then people start realizing that what that the great uh, role they played in revolutionizing the thought process of the entire human kind so it took us about thousands of years hundreds of years to understand that so the thought wave which was emanated by them to realize that to reciprocate to that to vibrate to that frequency it takes maybe centuries together why the entire human kind is not prepared for that is not in the same state of vibration in which that vibration was emanated was transmitted so it may take years together but it's not lost it is there the moment the entire human kind is in that state of vibration if not the entire at least a the majority a huge section of the human kind has now started relating to that vibration and then those ideas become more and more palpable we start realizing the importance of those ideas so that's what is being indicated here that this they are not lost in this world if you think a single good thought and you may feel that no one recognizes it no one understands the importance of it and you may feel very uh, dejected that no one can relate to my thoughts know it for certain it's never lost today or tomorrow a time will come when someone who is up to it you will find he is relating to that vibration so there is no thought which is lost so what we are thinking is very important not only to us but also for the entire world by thinking something good i myself and overhauling my own personality and at the same time i am inviting all the good thoughts of that vibration to influence me and then i find that my goodness becomes spontaneous because i am helped by the thought vibrations of the entire world 
the moment i get attuned to it the entire world of the same vibration is there to help me out to evolve at a much faster rate at an accelerated pace spontaneously i don't have to exert myself that's why sri ramakrishna used to say that the if you proceed one step i will be try that the god will come running 16 steps so what's that 16 step the help of this all those thought vibration which are there the moment you get tuned to it the entire world of those good vibration is there to help you out by as if pulling you out at a tremendous pace a tremendous acceleration the same thing happens with the evil thought a single evil thought a single evil thought can immediately attract all the evil thoughts of the same vibration you will find that now i am started i have started degrading at a very fast pace no one can stop it so that's how the good thoughts and bad thoughts it's not something which is affecting me individually it has it is a network where i get influenced by all the vibrations of the same thought and i also start influencing the collective mind by all by emanating those vibrations so it is quite possible therefore that that as that this atmosphere of ours is full of such thought pulsations both good and evil every thought projected from every brain goes on pulsating as it were until it meets a fit object that will receive it any mind which is open to receive some of these impulses will take them immediately so when a man is doing evil actions he has brought his mind to a certain state of tension and all the waves which correspond which correspond to that state of tension and which may be said to be already in the atmosphere will struggle to enter into his mind that is why an evil doer generally goes on doing more and more evil his actions become intensified such also will be the case with the doer of good he will open himself to all good waves that are in the atmosphere and his good actions also will become intensified we run therefore a two fold danger in doing evil first we open ourselves to all the evil influences surrounding us secondly we create evil which affects others maybe hundreds of years hence yes hundreds of years you will find that the doctrines which the hitler believed the nazi army this nazi so we thought with the second world war it has ended has it ended you will find that in the present world still there are many who actually ascribes to those ideas it's not lost the moment you my your mind starts vibrating in a particular pulsation you will find your influence they are all there just by physically through war i cannot stop them the mind is such it is always existing it is being influenced the moment i just take my mind to that level immediately is getting influenced so just external physical war cannot stop those mental vibration it is there to affect us maybe hundreds of years hence in doing evil we injure ourselves and others also in doing good we good to ourselves and to others as well as and like all other forces in man these forces of good and evil also gather strength from outside so now we will understand that the importance of trying to be good if i try a little try to just keep my mind good a little know it for certain gradually i will find that i that the from within me as if i find that all the hindrances are as falling off because the all the so called the vibrations of good thoughts are there waiting for me to help me out for, for uh, help me out in overhauling my personality in evolving me 
at a much faster rate, which I alone could have never done. So that's why even in our tradition, we find that the importance is given to so much, so much importance is given to Japa. That some sacred mantra, we go on repeating. We have been asked by the guru, just repeat. If you find that even your mind is not concentrated, but at least repetition that you can do. Try to do it again and again. Try to repeat the mantra that whenever uh, it, it's possible, you just repeat the mantra. Why? Why it has been asked? For the same reason that when you're trying to keep your mind with the help of mantra at a particular level of frequency, know it for certain, all those who have chanted that mantra, not only chanted, by chanting that mantra, they have evolved so much that they even had went to the highest rung of spiritual evolution. So immediately you're at getting attuned to all the thought webs of those frequency who have just resorted to that same mantra and just have evolved spiritually. Immediately you get connected to that. So sometimes that's the best satsanga. Many times it may happen that someone has told that uh, such and such holy person has come and people throng around him. But it may be so that I am sitting there, but my mind is not yet ready to receive the vibrations which he is emanating. I'm not yet prepared. And then though I am physically present in front of him, it won't be of much avail. And to the contrary, most probably that I couldn't uh, make it, that, that I couldn't get the opportunity to be physically present in front of such a holy person because of the circumstances, because of my responsibilities, most probably I never could avail that. But that if I have that real urge for spiritual evolution and my mind is constantly hankering for it, the mind is the best guru it immediately gets attuned to those vibrations. They may be far off. And that's the real satsanga. Though you are far away, though maybe you are not in physical presence of a holy person, but you can be in association by being, by being attuned to the thought levels in which they are, by trying a little. And that's what Swami is saying. And the same thing happens when we resort to the evil thoughts. You will find that we are as if dragged down in spite of all our effort to resist, we cannot. Once we start falling, it, it becomes a very, very, what you say, that a, it is just like going down a, a slope, in a slippery slope. You just simply slide down. There's no way you can be pulled up because all the evil forces there also join hands and is received by you to degrade you at a much faster rate. So. That's the importance of the good thoughts and the evil thoughts, which Swamiji at the very beginning of the lecture is indicating too. So now he will enter into the topic which he has taken, that the self-abnegation, that non-attachment is complete self-abnegation. That what, that in Karma Yoga, we again and again speak of non-attachment. What that non-attachment really means it is denying oneself. And that alone is the spiritual practice. So this, to bring this point home, Swamiji will now gradually enter into the discussion. So according to Karma Yoga, the action one has done cannot be destroyed until it has borne born its fruit. No power in nature can stop it from yielding its results. So as we told, Swami Vivekananda, whenever he's speaking, is having the scriptures on the background of his mind. So in our Vedanta, in the concept of, as a concept of Vedanta Yoga, we'll find there's a concept of three types of karma. What, what are these three types of karma? Sanchita karma, Prarabdha karma, and Agami karma. The Sanchita karma is the action which is yet born fruit. What is Sanchita Karma like? 
it's all the samskaras which we have but which is not fructifying now to give a common example suppose for the first time i just have tasted the donut someone took me to a shop and gave me donut i liked very much relished it and then i forgot about it and then after maybe about 6 months or about a year, after one year uh, later and suddenly i see that donut and immediately the craving for it comes back what has happened the impression of it was hidden in my subconscious mind as there was no favorable circumstances it was there it was not popping up the moment i see it immediately that memory oh that one year back i had it it's a wonderful immediately the craving for it develops so all those actions which because of the lack of proper environment is just lying hidden is not yet to start it fructifying they are the sanchita they are just there sanchita karma prarabdha the actions which have started fructifying uh the, that because of my past actions i have got some favorable circumstances suppose as a student i wanted to be a doctor so i studied hard and i got into a medical college now the favorable circumstances is there for this all those urge to be become a doctor which has got the favorable circumstances so they have started fructifying as a medical student and in future again as a doctor all those samskaras which i actually uh, i have i i myself was uh, acting upon that has got the favorable circumstances and they have started fructifying those are the prarabdhas the actions which have already started yielding result they are the prarabdha and agami agami is the third that actions which i am doing now they are also forming samskaras they also according to the samskaras in future they are going to yield result so any action cannot be destroyed either in the form of sanchita or prarabdha or agami it is there there may be that at present i see some are fructifying that doesn't mean that once this the result i just enjoy the results of these actions my karma will be exhausted there are so many karmas of which i am not aware of at all they are hiding when they wherever i get favorable circumstances they will start immediately they will pop up and they will start fructifying i myself will be amazed you know life it happens why well, never knew that i had so much liking for such and such thing when you get a favorable circumstances they simply comes and overwhelms you so in our scripture they give that example of an archer a hunter an archer uh, was just uh, on the in the forest was at a, was just aiming at a bird sitting in the branch of a tree he took out one of the arrows and placed it on his bow and shoot it and then he was not sure whether the arrow is going to hit the bird or not so to be sure that i don't miss hitting the bird the quiver the archer the hunter took brought out the second arrow from the quiver and placed it on the bow and now when he was about to throw the thought came that it is not good to kill the birds i shouldn't be violent and now very nicely the scripture is saying that all the arrows which are in the quiver i won't be using them at all because that sense of that uh, ahimsa has dawned in me that i shouldn't kill others as i that ahimsa has dawned in me i am not going to use those arrows anymore the arrow which i am going to shoot i am yet to shoot i have just already kept in my bow I have took out from my quiver i have kept in the bow and about to shoot i am not going to shoot that also because that ahimsa has dawned in me but the arrow which i have already shot which is yet to hit the mark but it has already been shot i have no control over it it may hit it may hit the mark or it may miss 
but I have no control. It has already been released. So that's how the scripture with this example explains the three types of karma. The sanchita, all the arrows which are in the quiver yet to be shot, they are the sanchita. The arrow which I have already shot, that is our prarabdha. And the action which I am about to do, that is the agami. Its result will be in the future. So these are the actions. So of which the prarabdha have already started fructifying. Others are not fructifying that they will fructify. You cannot just simply get rid of them if that ahimsa hasn't dawned in you. So that's the point that detachment should come. Without detachment, I can never get rid of the actions because there are innumerable arrows in the quiver. I cannot simply get rid of them. So these actions, once you have done as a sanskar, it is going to be there and it today or tomorrow, it is going to this bear the fruit. We are going to bear the fruit of that action. If I do an evil action, I must suffer for it. There is no power in this universe to stop or stay it. Similarly, if I do a good action, there is no power in the universe which can stop its bearing good results. So we must not think that someone is there up in the sky who is there to deliver the results of our action. No one is there. It is we. What happens when we do evil action? We have been made in such a way there is something called conscience, viveka, that conscience, that our conscience is such, it is bound to be affected. And it is that conscience that starts uh, reshaping your mind. It starts rusting. If you have done an evil action, it will start rusting your mind in such a way that you are you yourself are accruing the result of it. To give an example, uh, whether you have heard it or not, this name of Edgar Casey. He's known as a sleeping prophet. He used to go in a state of drowsiness, and then he used to prophesize. And he was from a Christian background, but when he used to prophesy, he used to speak of past birth. When someone asks that why such and such person is suffering, because in his past birth he did such and such thing. So it was something new to the Western world. So they never believed in this transmigration. But that's what he was saying. And there are a lot of studies of this Edgar Casey. He's a very famous person. So his prophecies, he's a sleeping prophet. So his prophecies are wonderful. If, we, if you have any chance to study, a person was, just one example I'm giving, there are thousands of such studies. A person was born blind. And it's not that there was any defect in, in the eye. It had something to do with the brain's connection with the eye, with the neural pathway. There was some defect, he was born blind. When he was taken to Edgar Casey, someone told, the case study has to be done. What he told was a great revelation. That what? That just, uh, we are not going to uh, discuss the science behind it, that how our psyche starts affecting us. He told that in some past birth, he belonged to a particular tribe. Who had the, uh, the uh, for that tribe, the practice, what was the practice? That they, whenever they conquered another tribe, they were very, they always used to fight with the other tribes for resources. And whenever they used to conquer the other tribe, those who were captured, if a very horrible practice was there, they will just uh, tie him and forcefully blind him by using some sharp weapon, they will cut the eyes. And this is the person who was actually doing that act, that he was uh, the one to whom this duty was ordained to make other people blind by hurting their eyes, by tearing, by just simply uh, using some sharp weapon to just scratch the eyeballs. So that's that horrible practice they was doing. And this birth, he himself is born blind. And what's the reason he's saying? Because when you are doing an evil act, it is affecting your psyche. 
it is affecting your psyche and that at la after all the body is a projection of the mind and our scriptures say that as per your mind uh, the body uh, will have its own what is the physical advantages and disadvantages even in the modern science we will find they say that all our diseases are psychosomatic that if you are very tensed from the tension you may develop so many lifestyle diseases blood pressure diabetes and other so the body the disease state of your body has something to do with the mind so all the actions actually that way it's not someone who is wet sitting outside and saying oh you have done such and such evil action for that you have to accrue such an evil result no it says we reap what we sow what we this is we sow what we reap so whatever we are reaping that's what we have sown we have what you sow that you reap so it's all that the what is in the effect of our own psyche so if i have done an evil action it is going to affect me i can never get rid of it in any way if i am a they say that if uh we are some in this life if we are a glutton they say that in the next birth you will be having a very uh, you will be dyspeptic your stomach will be very weak and in this edgar casey study is very wonderful that how it affects the psyche he's given a wonderful example suppose in outdoors you are having some in a picnic you are having a sumptuous meal and suddenly some beggar comes and immediately you will find your hunger is gone you 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 immediately find yet that uh, your temper is that your temperament your has changed you feel extremely um, disturbed that oh i was about to enjoy the food and someone is here uh, out of hunger is begging and immediately you find that your so called the hunger has gone you don't feel like eating so he says that with the glutton that's the thing which is happening that in this world there are so many people who are dying of hunger each and every time i re- just relish food i just over relish i just am uh, indulging over indulging it's affecting my psyche somehow the same way when i am about to take food when the beggar comes the way it affects my psyche and it, even unperceptibly it goes on affecting your psyche and that's how i develop the way my hunger is, is gone when someone hungry comes and stands in front of me and begs for the food similarly my appetite is being affected the every time i am over indulging in food and that in the long run is having the effect in my body maybe not in this birth again in the next birth so what we are saying is this that there is something called mind from which the body is been projected that mind is something permanent in our scriptures uh, very nicely they give the example the way the nails comes out you pierce the nail again it comes out from your body the way the nails come out from your body similarly this physical body is coming out from your mind one body is gone you have pierced it off another body comes but it is the main body is the mind that's why it is the sukshma sharira it is the linga sharira the linga sharira means the indicator that the, from your the physic i can know your mind the way your physic finds expression behind that the mind is working your disease speaks of the mind so all these effects of the actions are not lost everything or every action i do it is affecting my mind which in turn is again going to affect my body so not a single karma is getting lost it is constantly molding and remolding my mind and in turn my bodies this present body or the bodies which i will get in the future incarnations in the future uh, births so if i do any evil action i must suffer for it there is no power in the universe to stop or stay it similarly if i do a good action there is no power in the universe which can stop its bearing the good results the cause must have its effect nothing can prevent or restrain this 
Now comes a very fine and serious question about karma yoga. Namely, that these actions of ours, both good and evil, are intimately connected with each other. We cannot put a line of demarcation and say, this action is entirely good and this entirely evil. There is no action which does not bear good and evil fruits at the same time. So any action cannot be purely white or purely black. It cannot be purely good or purely evil. That's what Swami is saying. Every action we do, it is misra. There is a gray zone. I cannot say that it is perfectly white or perfectly black. Black. There is a gray zone behind each and every action. So now comes a big question. Sometimes I think that by constantly doing good karma, I will have, I will, pre I will just create a destiny, which is like eternal heaven. There is no way of coming down, but that is not possible, because all our actions are mixed, good and evil. Somehow, however good we may be doing, somehow there will be some traces of evil lurking behind it. And if that is so, then what happens? As in the Bhagavad Gita, it has been mentioned. Even in our Upanishads, it has been mentioned. Kshine punye marte lokam visanti. When the results of the good actions is over, it's the evil, the traces of the evil that also has accumulated, that again pulls me down to this transitory world of existence. So what's the way out? Am I constantly to be in the sway of this karma? Sometimes going high and sometimes falling just in the ebb of the wave, like a wave. Sometimes we are going the top of it and sometimes we are on the ebb of it. Is it our destiny? So that's the thing Swamiji is indicating. Then what's the way out? If there's no action which does not bear good and evil fruits at the same time. And now he's just given a common example to take the nearest example. I'm talking to you and some of you perhaps think I'm, do, I'm doing good. And at the same time, I am perhaps killing thousands of microbes in the atmosphere. I'm thus doing evil to something else. So this is a wonderful thing Swamiji is saying. That when I am speaking, those words, you may feel that, yeah, these are the words which purifies my thought process, which helps me to uh, overhaul my personality. So it's something good. But one thing when I'm talking, what to, when, why to speak of when I'm talking? At each and every moment of my life, can my life be really good for all? It's impossible. Can I be totally nonviolent? It is impossible. Why? The example is so but I'm killing thousands of microbes in the atmosphere. What is happening in my body? With each and every breath, there are millions of microbes entering my body. And constantly what the, my blood, the white blood, the, the WBC, the white blood corpuscles, they're doing this producing the antigens and the antibodies. It's a constant fight going on. They are the army within the body. Whenever the microbes come and they're attacking them, killing them, this constant war is going on. The perfect nonviolent person, person, a perfect ahimsa person is a dead body. You will find that once a person is dead, it takes just a few hours. It starts decomposing, it starts rotting. That's why we have to have the funeral, have the cremation, or if you have to just uh, uh, bury it, whatever we do, we have to do it as quick as possible. Why? It's immediately starts decomposing. Why it's decomposing? Because now it is perfectly ahimsa. The microbes and all find it a very wonderful breeding ground. It starts decomposing very fast. As long as I'm alive, if I just take a vow, till death I won't have food. Swamiji will be indicating that there are some religions who say that as my existence is constantly harming others, but I stop taking food, 
till I die. But really it's a fact that till you die, even when I'm not taking food, I'm not drinking water, I am constantly killing. Because these antigens, antibodies are constantly killing millions of microbes. So now try to relate yourself to that world of microbes. Just think you are a microbe. Can you say that human being is a wonderful being? Impossible. So there are very various stages of existence. The world to which I am aware of is a totally different spectrum. There it may appear that everything what I'm doing is good. But at our other level of spectrum, <clears throat> at some other spectrum, my existence is actually horrible, is a <clears throat> demonic to them. But I cannot relate to that spectrum. But at the same time, I cannot deny the fact that my existence is just like a demon to the so-called that spectrum of existence. So how can I say that all I do is only good, that I know it is going to harm others? That's why you will find in the Yoga Sutra very nicely, they say that sometimes when we speak of Ahimsa, we give so much importance only to the physical level, we forget that how we are affecting the, in the mental level, not only that, as an overhaul, as an, uh, uh, what you say that, if you take the entire thing, that overall uh, picture, you find that in no way you can be perfectly ahimsa. The moment I am born, in Brihadarana Kupanishad it is said, asanaya himrityu, asanaya, means the moment you are hungry, that is death. Why? Your hunger is invariably going to be the result of death of some other creatures in one form or other. Ashanaya Himrityu. So the moment I lie, I am just taking the birth in a physical form, the first cry comes out. With that, the death has to coexist. So in Yoga Sutra, they say that, okay, that I must try to be Ahimsa as much as possible, but know it for certain, the real practice of Ahimsa lies in a total different dimension. What's that? That I have to live the life in such a way that I that in such a detached way that detachment becomes such a normal uh, orientation of my psyche that I don't have the urge to be born again in this physical plane. That's the real ahimsa. That I have to live the life in such a way that I don't have to reincarnate again in this physical plane because. Perfect life is a contradictory term. Swami Vivekananda will come to this point. Life means that evil has to coexist with it. Life in the physical plane is, is designed in such a way that evil has to coexist with it. I cannot think of my life without in any way harming others. It is in, designed in such a way. So we have to go out of this to come in this physical form is the biggest disease, bhava vyadhi. So that's Shankaracharya is saying that what is the greatest disease? To be born in this physical plane again and again. That is the biggest disease. That's the bhava vyadhi, the soul which is non-local, the real spirit which has no locality with sense of limitation within time space causation. It's getting localized. What can be a greater disease than that? In our body, when we say it's diseased, when suddenly, when we find that my heart is aching, my head is aching, my knees are aching, the awareness which was supposed to pervade the entire body. When I'm healthy, my awareness is throbbing through the entire body. That gets localized when I'm diseased. The ease is no more there. I have got diseased. When my awareness is in the entire body, I'm at ease, I'm relaxed. When I feel diseased, when it gets localized, the ease has gone, it, I am diseased. Then what can be a greater disease when I feel I am this psychophysical existence? The one who really is non-local, whose amnes is in no way limited by time space causation. It was, it is, it will be, and it is not limited by space. It is non-local. So such amnes, when it is getting identified, 
that is the greatest evil so there cannot be perfect life that i will lead that i want to be born again and again in this physical plane because i want to lead a very nice life i won't harm anyone these terms are contradictory it can never happen so all the actions that's what swami is saying is misra then the question comes how can there be the liberation if this is misra that the idea of eternal heaven how it can be it cannot be that scriptures say kshine punye martya lokam visanti again and again we have to come down once the punya is exhausted the remnants of my evil actions which i have missed which most probably i haven't done willingly but my existence in the physical plane entails that it has to be there it is going to bring me back then what's the way out so that is the big question swami ji is placing before us before he enters into the real concept of karma yoga so that the detachment it's not uh, trying to do good actions or evil actions as per my station in life as per my uh, position in life responsibilities of life are concerned i have to do certain thing let me do it in a detached fashion not with a sense of agency so that's the way that that the body mind as per its present situation is going through particular responsibilities particular actions but i am not it i don't uh, expect anything out of it i don't owe them neither i expect anything out of them so th- that's orientation is the main thing not what you are doing so that's the thing swami ji will gradually come into the discussion so with this we will find that very nicely swami ji is uh, taking the nature of the karma bringing out the nature of the karma and with that he is trying to prove that it is impossible to think of an eternal heaven by resorting to the good actions it can never be if that's the thing then what's the way out so that he will bring into the discussion as he gradually proceeds through the lecture we will take part we will uh, we will just go on with our discussion with the next portion of the lecture and continue with this discussion on this swami's lecture again in the next class with this we stop our discussion today thank you namaskar thank you namaskar swami ji ha namaskar shri ram swami ji namaskar swami ji namaskar